You heard the saying, nothing ever goes as planned. The Christian version adds an element. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Have you experienced that? Yeah? You think of times where this really didn't go as planned. Not even close. Well, we're going to talk today about what should a Christian's relationship with plans be. How should we think about plans? How should we approach them? Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19, at least starting there. We're going to move into chapter 20. Uh, I believe it was 787 in the Bible underneath the chairs. Uh, we're at the end of the third missionary journey. Paul goes out. Uh, he's done this three times now. It's toward the end where he, he goes out. And now that he has already established some churches, he goes back and helps to strengthen them. We're going to see, encourage them. Uh, he's in Ephesus. And uh, as I read through this passage here, I want you to look and see how often does Paul make plans or intentions and decide something. So pay attention to that specifically. I'll stop along the way and explain some things, including right here in verse 21. It says, Now after these events, Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem. So that in the Spirit raises a question because uh, you... Remember, don't you, I've shared before, the earliest manuscripts we have of the Bible are all in capital letters. Uh, I, I don't like it when people write in all caps and messages. I, you do that on Facebook, I won't even read it. So uh, it's hard to read, but that was the style then. And so the earliest ones we have are all caps. So was the Greek word for spirit capitalized? Yes, uh, the S was, but so was the P and the I, you know, in their Greek equivalents. And so we don't know, is this uh, their way, you know, it, was this meant to be the Holy Spirit or is this meant to be Paul's Spirit? You know, did he resolve in the Spirit with the Spirit's help? Did he resolve just in his own Spirit? Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, he certainly was always trying to follow the Spirit's leading, so it probably in, in one sense really comes out about the same. But it says, now after these events, he resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome, the capital of the world. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. It's the third time Christianity has been called the way, and again, I like that. Uh, you know, it's it's the path that we follow. It directs where we go. It's our way of life. Uh, so, but it created a disturbance for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, uh, brought no little business to the craftsmen. So, Artemis is also known as Diana. She's one of the Greek and Roman goddesses, uh, and her main temple was here in Ephesus. So she was, uh, th this was the center of Artemis worship. And when it says he made shrines, it appears that he made small little replicas of the temple of Artemis, which was quite, it was named as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so he made those for souvenirs. People would come there to visit and uh, buy one of his shrines, take them home. Uh, these he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. That's quite a testimony to Paul. You know, he's had such an impact on this area uh, by his preaching, by his teaching, and as we saw last week, uh, those who believed and went out and did the same thing, disciples who made disciples. Because it's, it has caused a downturn in our business because of that. People aren't worshiping the gods like they used to. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. And she may even be deposed of her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Well, Demetrius didn't know it, but he was prophetic there. Because that temple of Artemis was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It had 127 pillars. Uh, and now the only thing that's barely standing is one of them. And uh, she did go 
the, the way he said there. Verse 28, when they heard this, the people around, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, the amphitheater that uh, history tells us, and you can still see it there, uh, would hold 24,000 people. Dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. Uh, Paul saw this as a great opportunity. Look at these hundreds, maybe thousands of people. I'll preach to them. Uh, and he probably thought, you know, so far when Christianity has been challenged, the Roman authorities have said, you know, uh, that it is a legitimate religion. So he thought he had that on his side. But his friends like, uh, these people aren't thinking reasonably. Uh, and it says even the, some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of him, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So these were people who were elected uh, not to a political office, but uh, to more of uh, what they would do is set up festivals, uh, you know, for the gods, for, in this case, Artemis. Uh, and they say, don't, don't go in there. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had even come together. So you got a mob mentality going on. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. So he was a Jew, and he basically, it seems, wanted to say, Paul is different from us. You know, he's a Jew by nationality, but don't lump us in with this. But that's exactly what they did. When they recognized he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, to them, there, there wasn't a big difference. In this specific area, there really wasn't. The Jews also worshipped only one God and did not worship idols. And so there was that similarity. And the crowd, for two hours, imagine, just chanting over and over and over. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, it says, when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, and he would be the chief elected official in that town. So he was basically responsible, certainly to Rome, for what went on. He said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? So what it seems like is there was a meteorite that fell to this spot. And either it initially looked like uh, in what the, all the statues of Artemis show is a multi-breasted woman. Either it initially looked like that or they took this meteorite and they carved that. Uh, but that's what he's talking about. This is where this stone resides, this main area for Artemis. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemer, blasphemers of our gods. Paul was very clear that gods made by human hands were not gods, but he never directly blasphemed a specific god. You see this when he was in Athens. He talked about there is one true god. But he didn't attack Diana. He didn't need to. If people came to believe in the one true God, uh, they would, as had been happening, withdraw from worship of Diana. And he says, If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are really in danger of being charged with rioting today. You remember, in ancient Rome and territories they had conquered, that was about the worst thing. You've heard of the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. That was Rome's main goal, and that's what he was charged with. He knew he would be in trouble. He would lose his position or worse if things got out of hand because Rome just wanted to keep the peace. Uh, because if you could keep the peace, it would make things a lot easier to rule those lands. And so he's saying, hey, let's, let's don't do this today. It would be bad for all of us. Uh, he says, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So they listened to him. Verse 1 of chapter 20 says, After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There you have in two verses this idea again of encouragement. How important must that be? Again, it, it makes me think if we don't need, need encouragement to live the Christian life, maybe we're not living the Christian life uh, that 
gets you know attacked by Satan, as we're going to talk about some, you know, that he oppresses us. So he says he came to Greece. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So he was going to take a ship, found out about a plot. He didn't want to be on board a ship with people who were going to try to kill him. A lot of opportunities there to just slip him overboard. So he decides he's going to just walk uh, and return through Macedonia. So Peter, the Berean son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the agents, Tychus and Trophimus, these went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. And when you see these us or we passages, it means that Luke, the author of Acts, was actually with Paul at this time. Sometimes he, he's getting reports of what happened. He wasn't there. Other times he was there firsthand. So he's including that. It says, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So that's the, the feast that uh, accompanies the Passover. And in five days, we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Uh, as I was reading, a couple commentaries pointed out that usually that trip uh, took maybe two or three days. This time it took five days. So there's one you don't necessarily know, but there's a, a plan or an expectation they had. It uh, didn't work out that way. Then it says in verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. So here you have them meeting on the first day of the week, Sunday. And breaking bread... Again, when you see that in the early New Testament context, it is talking about a meal, uh, which then led into the Lord's Supper. It was not just one or the other. Uh, they would have their love feast, and it would also include the Lord's Supper. Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So they would have been working on the first day of the week. You know, that was not a day off, and so they would come together afterward and, and have their meeting. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. It was dark then, so they needed the lamps for light. But you can imagine, uh, it would also create some heat. Uh, one person pointed out maybe a little hypnotic sort of effect of the flickering lights. Well, there was a young man named Eutychus, so probably anywhere from 7 to 14. He was sitting at the window, uh, certainly to get some fresh air, some cool air. He sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, <laughs> as Paul kept going on and on. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So he fall, fell out a third story window and died because he fell asleep during Paul's sermon. Well, Paul went down and bent over him as the prophets uh, Elisha and Elijah, we see them do, uh, when they resurrected someone. Taking him in his arms, he said, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while. He went until daybreak. So we're not sure when he started, but he went from at least midnight to daybreak. And so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So, you know, here you have the Apostle Paul with you. This is your chance. They're going to listen as long as he'll talk. And he had no problem talking a long time. So... Uh, back then, if, if you happened to fall asleep during his sermon, you were in luck. That happens here, you're out of luck because I can't raise you from the dead. So <laughs> be careful. Verse 13, by going ahead to the ship, but going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged, intending to go himself by land. So they were basically going to sail around the peninsula, and Paul says, I just want to walk across. Maybe he went a little time by himself. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos. And the next day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So that comes 50 days after Passover. Paul didn't make it there for Passover. He was hoping to get there for Pentecost. So you see how often in this passage the word decided comes up, uh, intending, resolved, uh, even things like this. Uh, you know, Paul was hastening there. His plan was to try to get there. It doesn't say it, but that's the word plan. But he had a plan. I want to get there before Pentecost. Uh, and, and you think about it, that kind of thing is to be expected. You know, when is the last time you had a day with no plans? Yeah, no plans at all. Pretty rare. When's the last time 
everything went exactly as you planned. Almost as rare. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Well, what do we do when our plans do not work out as expected? So, first thing is, why do our plans not work out as expected? Why don't they work out? We rely too much on ourselves. Okay. Maybe we wanted to get something done, it didn't get done. We, have no, we don't have patience. We don't have patience. <laughs> we jam too much into our day. Jam too much, try to get too much done. People get in the way. People get in the way. <laughs> that can happen. God has a reason. God has a reason. Yeah. So if for whatever reason, there's unforeseen events that come up. Some kind of change that, again, we didn't see coming, uh, a complication, maybe an opportunity. Um, and realize this applies even to well-intentioned, and, and you could say, just like I said to Paul, spirit-led plans. You know, seeking to follow the guidance of the spirit is not the same thing as receiving the spirit's guidance. You know, seeking to follow, you know, I, I think God would want me to do this, okay, but that doesn't mean God has said this is exactly how things are going to happen. Um, you know, they might not go the way we plan or expect, even if that's our, our thought, our intention. There's some reasons for that. One is, as I said, things just happen. You know, God does not cause everything that happens. God doesn't cause everything. There's nothing that indicates that. But he obviously allows it. There's nothing that happens that God doesn't allow. Now, sometimes we don't know. Did God cause this or did God allow this? We can't tell. Uh, I look in the, the text and example this Eutychus. I, I, there's no indication God caused Eutychus to fall asleep, fall out the window, and die. You know, things just happen. You get a young guy up there in that warm room, uh, hearing Paul go on and on for a long time. He falls asleep, falls out of the window, he dies. Things just happen. Well, sometimes for us, things just happen. You know, we have a flat tire. You know, we're, we're, on a, we're in a hurry to go outside there, the tire's flat. Uh, we oversleep. There's a work emergency. Had to work late, couldn't make it. Something comes up. There's a traffic jam. All these things. Things just happen. Sometimes we get a different idea or plan. You know, we are reevaluating. In light of this new opportunity, I am going to change my plan. You know, Paul not going to the theater. His plan initially was, I'm going to go into this theater and preach to these people. And his friends say, that's a really bad idea, Paul. Uh, and so he, he changes that. Something changes his plan. So another one, Acts chapter 16. I uh, thought of this example that we saw a while ago. It says, after Lydia was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Paul wasn't planning on going to her house and staying any length of time. But a new opportunity came up. Things changed. <coughs> uh, have you had occasions of that? You, I've got a plan, but something comes up and it looks like Maybe this, this new opportunity is better. Yeah, I think we all have. Now, there's no guarantee that it is better, is it? You know, maybe I should have stuck with my original plan. Maybe that would have worked out better in some sense. Uh, another reason things don't go as planned, Satan opposes us. You, know, you look at the riot here, uh, Demetrius is leading it, Satan is ultimately behind it. You look at the plot to kill Paul, the same thing. Satan is opposing him. Now, have you ever made a commitment to God and experienced opposition? Some kind of commitment. Either to do something or maybe to grow in some way, to, to face something, to mature. And, and Satan just, he doesn't want that to happen. He opposes us. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Do you realize that we face the schemes of the devil? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, not only. Sometimes we do. Our, the, there are physical elements, you know, we face. They're saying behind them, we really wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's what's going on all the time, unseen around us. And I, I've been looking more and more into that. And it, I, I think we need to give it more attention than we do. Realize that this is a spiritual battle that we face. 
And so sometimes our, our things don't go as planned because Satan is opposing us. And then sometimes God has a different plan. And if God has a different plan, it's better. And we know that, but it doesn't always seem that way, does it? You're <laughs> like, God, I thought my plan was pretty good. And God has a different plan. Isaiah 55 talks about this. I'm sure we're familiar with the passage. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. And we read that, we shake our head, but it's true. And we have to, to accept that at times. You know, uh, I got an idea. It seems like a pretty good idea, God. My way seems pretty good. God's ways are higher than my ways. Better than my ways. I don't always understand it. You experienced that? That at some point you had some idea where things were going and it was just clear. God led in a different direction. Maybe you realized it was better. Maybe it won't happen this side of heaven. I can remember out in Arizona. After I got, Lisa and I got married, and I decided I was going to look for a church to preach at, and ended up interviewing with two of them. Uh, one of them, it was in Mesa. Uh, it was uh, a little younger group, and off a of main road. Like, you got all kinds of visibility. Had a little bit of a praise team, the start of a praise team. The other was an older church. It was behind a power plant. Uh, it was off this little road that went through a neighborhood. You hardly got any visibility. There was a woman who played piano, and it was great, but very old and younger girl, but just very old, formal style. And I thought, God, I want that church in Mesa. That'd be the one. And didn't work out. Like, there were a couple people who just didn't want me there. And I ended up going to Scottsdale. We've never had a, had a church home like Scottsdale. Lisa's out there now. She's like, oh, I miss these people. Like, the most amazing experience we've ever had. God knew better. Sometimes that happens. So plans change from what we were hoping or expecting. Now, does that mean we shouldn't make plans? Like, well, they're going to change anyway. Why even make a plan? Uh, no, Paul's example definitely shows us. You know, he was making plans left and right. Uh, I think that's, you know, if, if you have any hope of achieving something worthwhile, there need to be plans. We've heard to fail to plan is to plan to fail. Uh, you need to have some intentions, some directions, some goals, some plans. But we should make them with a caveat. You know, James talks about this, and he's already, right, we'll look at the beginning of the passage earlier, but he says here that the caveat, instead, as you plan, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You know, here's my plan if it works out that way, if God allows it to work out that way. You know, there was a, a while I went through this because I had trouble sometimes when my plans don't go as planned. <laughs> and so I, I purposely in my mind, like, I'm not going to make plans, I'm going to make possibilities. <laughs> you know, I, I possibly on mowing the yard today <coughs> after church, you know, if I can get it done before the rain. I don't want to say I plan on it because I know what happens to plans. But it just helped me ingrain that in my mind. I, I possibly on doing this. Just to make that caveat that it's up to God, ultimately, whether it happens or not. Well, how should we react when things don't go as planned? Well, let me tell you, getting angry doesn't help. <laughs> I tried that. <laughs> I tried it over and over. It still didn't help. No, that isn't it. Now, it's even harder to not get upset, at least for me, when my plans are well-intentioned. I, I remember one morning in Arizona... And uh, Lisa was going to work, the kids were going, and I knew it was going to happen. And, like, I'm going to spend the morning just, you know, reading the Word and praying. This is going to be great. And I was just all getting ready to settle in, and the doorbell rang. Uh, and it was UPS. I'm like, all right, this won't take long. Well, as I opened the door for him, I guess this was before they dropped off packages, uh, opened the door, one of the dogs ran out. And this is one of the dogs who was a runner. She took off, and uh, yeah, I knew it was going to be a long day. She'll eventually come around. You find her, you put her in the car, she'll come back. But I was so upset. I was mad because I couldn't spend time praying and reading my Bible. So I don't know how that fits together. But I like, God, why would you not let this plan happen? Like, I, I was going to read your word and pray. Doesn't help to get angry, no matter what the plan is. C.S. 
C.S. Lewis has a great quote when it comes to this. He said, the great thing if one can is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or one's real life. See what he's saying? We've got our plan. Something comes up and we, that's an interruption to my life, to my plan. The truth is, of course, that what one calls interruptions are precisely one's real life. The life God is sending one day by day. What one calls real life is a phantom of one's imagination. <laughs> These interruptions aren't interruptions. They are life. Our version of life is what isn't real. We need to have that attitude. Insisting on control is the opposite of, it, of humility. When we insist on control, that is the very opposite of this foundational trait of humility. Who is really in control? God, obviously. So if I'm trying to be in control, who am I trying to be? God. Yeah, and we don't say that, but I'm trying to be the ultimate power in the universe. Well, humility, the essence of it is God is God and I'm not. God is God and I'm not. And when we set a plan and just assume it's going to go exactly the way I plan, I'm saying, well, yeah, I have this omniscience. I'm all wise, all knowing. It should happen this way. God says that's not the case. Job chapter 38, God speaking to Job. says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. God's talking a little smack there. <laughs> Come on, Job, surely you know how the measurements of the earth were set forth. He doesn't know. We don't know. God's saying, I'm God and you're not. Job forgot that for a little bit. And so God is reminding him. Proverbs chapter 15. It says, the mind of man plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. It says in uh, the ESV, the Lord establishes his steps. Others say the Lord determines his steps. Now we have free will. But our free will doesn't overcome some obstacles that we face sometimes. We can make our plans, but ultimately God, again, is shaping things around us that impact or even determine how it works out. Then I mentioned that passage in James. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. There's a business plan right there. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring let alone a year from now. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And how significant are you in the big grand scheme of things? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That should always be that caveat with us. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. So verse 21 again. Remember it said, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Uh, well, that does happen. Paul gets to Jerusalem, and from there, he begins a journey to Rome. But do you remember the details of the trip to Rome? Yeah, you remember the trouble that starts in the temple? The Jews charging him? Taking before the Romans. And Paul appeals to Caesar. And he starts this journey toward Rome. And Caesar, Paul gets to Rome, but it's in the course of a trial. That wasn't what he expected. When, he, when this was being said here, he had to resolve in his spirit. We go through this area, get to Jerusalem, and then get to Rome. I, he was thinking, yeah, and this is all that's going to take place. It didn't go at all like he expected. Pretty normal, isn't it? All right, I want us to think about it for a minute. What plans do you have? You don't have to share the plans, but I want you to think. Maybe large, grand scale. Maybe small, just what you're going to do this afternoon. What plans do you have? Do you have an if the Lord wills approach or attitude to it? Is that built into your possibly? <laughs> that I realize that's, that's always an element there. If the Lord ultimately allows this to happen, for whatever reason it might not, if he ultimately allows it, what needs to change to factor in humility as you make your day-to-day -day plans? 
again, for me, when I was making just normal day-to-day -day plans and getting upset when they didn't work out, it shouldn't be that way. I didn't want it to be that way. And that's why I started trying to think, <laughs> okay, God, I'm going to allow you to you know, put this caveat in place. Still working it up with it on some big things right now. Terrible. God, I know you're God and I'm not. Boy, I don't understand. Where are you with that, with plans? What do you need to change to keep them in line? Make plans that seek after God's will, but allow for things to go unexpectedly. Yeah, and handle them with humility. All right, any questions, comments today? You know, Steve, beginning of the year, I had goals. I don't set New Year's resolutions, but I set goals. Things I'd like to accomplish for this year. Some things had timelines. I want to get this done by this date. I want to get things done by that date. Whatever. Mom's health changed everything. Some things got the deadlines I thought I had in my head gone. Mm -hmm. You know, don't regret it. Nothing like that. None of the things I had goals were. Uh, life altering, you know, it's like, okay, if I get my truck done and painted by this day, great. It's not going to, probably not even get to by this year. But one of the things I learned from mom was that plans do change. What you expect to happen doesn't happen. But what she had taught me was whatever happens, let's just make the best of it. There you go. Yeah. That's, and you know, I've said this a hundred times, what's the difference between a good day and a bad day? Your attitude. Your attitude. Yeah. So that's totally true. Again, we, we have to make, you know, goals. And time elements are there. You know, a goal, who's that a goal without a time element? So, you know, just a wishful thinking. You know, so that's a, that's a wise way to do it. But then approach it with knowing it might not work out that way. Well, and you know, too, sometimes I wonder what kind of influence the, the devil really has on our plans, too, because. You know, ultimately, do we really ask him for a direction each day? You can say, hey, Lord, you know, I'd really like to get this, 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 and this done. But, you know, if you can help me with my plans, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. You know, which would give us a little bit more assurance, but we don't do it like that. We make usually make the plans and then start complaining when things don't happen. And it could be sabotage. You, you just, you know. You don't know. Again, it is an element to give more consideration to. I, I totally believe the spiritual warfare side of life. You're supposed to pray confidently. Have you given to us how to satisfy the possibilities? Well, you say you say plan confidently or pray? Pray confidently. Pray confidently. Well, it will be given to us if it's in line with God's will. But again, what's God's will? We don't always know what that is. You know, Paul didn't think it was God's will that he go to Rome, you know, in chains, but that's how he got to Rome. And so, and there are other things that he wanted that at times God said no. So there's that verse that talks about, you know, you have to see what verse you're thinking of specifically. Uh, but the verses that make it clear is we need to pray, you know, that there'll be a God will answer us affirmatively it needs to be clear it's within God's will. And we don't always know what that is. It's still hard, though, you know, as a leader of your family, you know, you're trying to make the best judgment you can for, you know, what needs to be done. And when things just don't go your way, you just got to have that mindset. Well, apparently that's not what's going to happen today. You know? Right. And it's tough when you don't know what. I mean, again, Chris <coughs> and I are talking recently. Like, okay, what is the you got to do something. What do you do? Wait on God. Well, in the midst of the waiting, sometimes you got to do something. What do you do? Put it in his hands. Okay. When you put it in his hands, you got to do something. What do you do? Wait on God. Yeah. I say, it just comes to a point. You, you have to do one thing or the other. You know? All right. While I'm waiting, and that waiting is not just even so much a chronological waiting, you know, I'll give you an hour type thing. It's it's this trusting and depending, and you do, but there's also, you know, in the course of it, I've got to go about my day-to-day -day life and do something. Ask for wisdom. Okay, yeah, I agree there. 
And you got, when we ask for wisdom, we have to be open to whatever his wisdom is. Sometimes we like, you know, I want your wisdom, God, but I'd really like it to be this. Yeah, soon. Well, sometimes and soon, we, yeah. Sometimes God gives us the wisdom through other people. We mm -hmm. have to ask for counsel. It's all throughout the Proverbs, we have to seek counsel. Yep, wisdom can come from others. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily come direct from God. Sometimes it's what we don't want to do that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most. Yeah. And it's going to keep bugging you until... And I think, yeah, God will ultimately make that clear. That, you know, here's what it is. Again, it doesn't do any good. talks about disciplining us. It doesn't do any good to discipline us if he doesn't tell us what the goal is. You know, it'd be like a parent. You know, we'll punish you, but I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> well, that's not a very good parent, so it wouldn't be a very good guy. You know, discipline you, but not tell you what I want you to learn. Yeah, you know, you think about the story of Job. Job never, we know why, what was happening. Job never did learn what was happening, at least in the text. But he had no idea why these things happened to him. Yeah. So he just had to trust God. He did pretty well. He just had a couple things that crossed the line, and that's why God said, <laughs> where were you? But, you know, if it was us, it's Job, whoa. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think he did pretty darn uh, Yeah, he did really well. And God yeah. does commend him for, yeah. for that. Yeah. Because what happened to him was over and above. Horrible. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too, I think about a lot. You know, I live in a free country. You know, I can believe what I want to believe. I don't have, I'm not persecuted much like a lot of other countries are. I mean, you know, we do, we are spoiled. You know, and, and we have to we have to continually think about that and, and ground ourselves on what he wants for us because as people we just want temporary happiness, you know. Boats and cars and bikes and vacations and stuff like that that we think we really need to be happy that we really don't. No, there's definitely some of that and we no one would deny it, you know, our general situation is better than just about anywhere else. But there are specific situations that arise that are very difficult. You know? life Even in the midst of a great country, you know. Yeah, you're gonna have real life to things come up that are difficult. Yeah. yeah. There's one thing you know for if you try something else, trust in God. Yeah. Give you the right answers. And go on. It comes that way and seek his wisdom for what those are. 